Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We are very excited to be here at Form Next 2020. Today's topic that we're going to talk about is the future of design and manufacturing with transformation of supply chain. So we're going to, we have an expert panel today, um, but before we get started, I would just like to remind you that if you have any questions, please feel free to visit slido.com or download the app um, and put your questions in the chat while you view this presentation. You can also reach out to any one of our panelists in Formnext uh, application, as well as directly through their contact information that you'll find uh, in Formnext. So with that, I would like to get started and introduce our esteemed panel. My name is Becky McMorrow. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Business Transformation at Worth Industry North America. And I'll start with uh, JC Flores, who's the Executive Additive Service services at Baker Hughes. We also have Dr. Mikhail Gladkeek, who is a technology and operations leader at Baker Hughes. Next is Dr. Brent Stucker, the distinguished engineer, additive manufacturing at ANSYS. And finally, AJ Strangquist, director of 3D solutions at Worth Industry North America. Thanks everyone for joining. We are very excited to get started. Our topic today revolves around the world is changing and industries are adapting. We are in the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution where infrastructure, computing power, multi-physics simulations, virtual and augmented reality drive design, validation, and manufacturing of new products. This in turn enables massive digitalization of industrial processes, specifically for manufacturing, Optimization and efficiency are shaping a new balance between classic subtractive and rapidly advancing additive processes. In our panel, we're going to explore the impact of this digitalization and transformation of design and manufacturing on supply chains and paint the picture of the industrial ecosystem of the future. We're going to build a case for the new paradigm of function driven, computationally enabled optimal design taking full advantage of complexity for free approach. This is the design of the future, which in turn enables transformation of supply chains. Make anything, anywhere, anytime, whether it is on the manufacturing plant floor, mass production line, or on the ocean floor. So let's talk first about why we should transform. Certainly 2020 was a challenging year. Pandemic is still raging on economic uncertainty and racial unrest. Why is there then a need of digital transformation and what part does additive manufacturing play in this? I'm gonna turn it over to Brent Stucker to uh, give us an overview of why we should transform. Thank you, Becky. And I think um, I'd like to also just give a brief introduction to ANSYS in case people are unfamiliar with ANSYS. Um, ANSYS has been around for 50 years. We're a company that does physics-based simulation. So what does that mean? That means if you design a part, you design a component, you want to know whether that component will actually work in the machine, in the airplane, or whatever. So that's what ANSYS does. We, we create software that predicts how things work. And ANSYS has been doing this for 50 years, but just three years ago, they bought a company that I started when I was a professor in additive manufacturing simulation. And that's when ANSYS got into this um, area of additive manufacturing. And that's why I'm here today to represent that. So thank you for having me. But if we think from this broader perspective of why do we trans need to transform in this fourth industrial revolution, this is a, a, a great question and it brings in implications of all kinds of societal uh, trends. If we think about the prior industrial revolutions, one, two, and three, they all required massive amount of concentration of expertise and people into specific locations in the world. And so we saw this huge migration of people from, you know, from uh, farmland and rural areas into cities in order to be able to support the kinds of massive leaps forward in technology that we've seen and the benefits to society that that has brought. 
But what we're seeing now, and particularly we see this here in 2020, is that people actually find that there's there are some drawbacks of being you know highly concentrated for instance the the some of the most deadly outbreaks of covid this year have been because of concentrations of people and things spreading before hospitals can catch up with them and so we think about the fourth industrial revolution it's an opportunity for people to be able to live anywhere, design from anywhere, manufacture at the point of need, rather than having to manufacture in highly concentrated expertise locations, like here's one area of the world that is expert in automobiles, and here's another that area of the world that are expert in you know, oil and gas equipment or whatever. We, we wanna be able to distribute and build what we need wherever we need it and allow people to live and work from wherever they want to work. So those are some of the main major drivers that are, are, are pushing why we're transforming. Thank you, Brent. Yeah, that helps uh, tell the story of, of why to transform, especially um, uh, where we are now. Um, so let's shift into the um, how we transform. And uh, JC and Mikhail from uh, Baker Hughes, can you give us an overview first of Baker Hughes and, and how they're uh, into uh, additive manufacturing and then talk a little bit then about how uh, you're enabling this transformation. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Becky, for the invitation. So I'm, I'm JC, JC Flores. I work for Baker Hughes for 23 years and Baker Hughes has been really you know, innovators for 100 years, I would say over a century old company. And uh, the, the value that we provide to the customers is about our solutions, right? How we have been able those solutions to address and specific needs, and mostly in the oil and gas that we play in it. Now, the question is, IT manufacturing was explored over eight years ago in the company to find the solutions of problems that we could not address with uh, standard manufacturing. So we actually started to know how we can use it in the, our vertical supply chain internally so we can actually be a little more efficient we can actually address so complex problem that probably we could afford to do it in standard manufacturing. I hope we can customize those solutions that we can actually drive you know, <clears throat> the value for our customers. So the journey started about eight years ago and we have been addressing internal needs for our portfolio. And in the recent year, we had a lot, a lot more requests from customers to support them in specific needs. And that was uh, now an initiative that uh, came a couple of customers asking, okay, can we do this? You know, I think this, we can do it. Probably we can do it in additive. So those solutions started to explore and we got a lot of traction with those. So that, that's, the, that's the way we you know, started thinking, okay, this is a service that we need to actually provide. And um, IT manufacturing services was born. So, and that was really by the needs and it's driven by the customer in a specific emergency situations. There were a disruption supply chains in which you could actually fit for purpose an IT product and it actually drive the value for the customer. So like, like Brent mentioned before, the fourth industrial revolution is, is a way to think about how you connect the internet of things, how you connect that decentralization of masses to a production at the end of the user. So we are moving from a centralized structure that have all the control and specialization and the efficiency of economy of scales in one location. Now you have huge distribution centers or channels that actually distribute those mass product produced parts into our customers. Now the evolution of that will be that it going to hybrid system that you want to have it customized it at the end of the line, but it's going to be evolved depending on each one of the industries that we play on. Something that we learned in 2020 <clears throat> is that that evolution has been accelerated by the need, right? And maybe if we didn't have that in a situation as COVID presented to us, there was not a, that, that urgency need. Everybody noticed the PPE requirement from the hospital, right? So there was an adaptation there that was actually an urgent need of a life or death threat for some facilities. And IT provided a solution, immediate solution, then nobody actually thought about the regulation or requirements of what should it work or not. No, there was no matter of that you have to actually try to see if it actually work. That urgency drove you know, the adoption of it. Now you have many hospitals and many other places. Okay, that's a possible solution for those cases, right? Now, at the same time, when you actually go into those emergency solutions, you understand that 
you can do a little bit more than just a replacement of product by product. You can actually improve the product because you have the opportunity to modify it on the fly. You have the prototype typing fast and you can actually optimize the product as you actually develop it. So that, that was a fantastic learning in 2020. And we will see um, how the industry adopts. And this is not only in the medical industry, each one of the segments that has some adoption has accelerated because they, they saw that the supply chain disrupted. We're not talking about going 100% because it's impossible. The technology is not there, right? And if we shouldn't, there are some places that we have to play in between. That hybrid model will evolve from a, a rate of that inventory management or spare part man management from, from the actual physical, you know, quantifiable inventories to some digital format. But that's an evolution that we have to actually work. And, and that's what we're working right now internally. We're working our internal product companies, how we manage that you know, inventory or that participation to the digital world, how we transform ourselves and how we actually do that to drive solutions that create value for our customers. And that's, that's a journey, that's a journey. No, that's great, JC. And Mikhail, can you uh, help explain a little bit more about uh, and build on, on the transformation in terms of acceleration, right? Because, you know, what JC mentioned is uh, even though some companies weren't ready, we're forced to uh, transform. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about this acceleration and how, uh, how you've enabled uh, this transformation more quickly? Yes, thank you, Becky. Uh, of course. I've been with, uh, with Baker Hughes for over 15 years in different product lines, different roles, and uh, with additive for quite some time. And I've been driving adoption of additive manufacturing in uh, internal product lines for internal customers. And I've seen that adoption and acceleration. And in the beginning, of course, it's a new technology. People don't trust it. People require a lot of um, uh, testing validation. People don't quite understand how it can help. So education is a big part of it and uh, showing examples, showing case studies, showing what it can do. But at some point, when you get to real, real life examples, like JC was talking about, there is an urgency. Part is not simply not available any other way. Can you help? We have a, a customer, we have a contract, we need to drill that well. Can you help with the spare part? Yes, we can. So this is where you, you start uh, accelerating that adoption. Uh, and then the design, the improvement of portion of that. Um, with additive, we can really take that, um, that approach of complexity for free. Anything is possible. So you can truly create designs that are optimal for the problem. And when we had certain operational uh, problems within Baker Hughes, traditional manufacturing cannot accomplish that design that is required by operational conditions. Now you go to Adif and say, well, can we do it differently? Uh, can we change the manufacturing process? Can we actually build that shape that will provide the solution to operational problems? This is where acceleration also uh, starts and this is how you build that knowledge, expertise and buy-in for the parts. And overall, uh, thinking about what uh, Brent also said about industrial revolutions and uh, societal changes, if you think about it, manufacturing methods themselves pretty much remain the same for over the you know, past 50 to 200 years. We're still cutting metal, milling, joining parts together, and we're still doing that on a massive scale. Now with additive, we can change it. We can do something different. And um, when I think about this uh, digital transformation, it's also it's a transformation of design and manufacturing. And in the manufacturing world, it means moving from everything from paper-based processes, from drawings to uh, fully digital, with what we call digital passport of a part becoming a single source of truth. And that digital file available anywhere you need that part and being able to create that part uh, at the point of use. This is where that efficiency is coming to, into the picture. Efficiency, cost of uh, fabrication, uh, and removing errors associated with all these paper-based processes of today. This is the true ecosystem of the future. And then you start adding on top of that um, connected equipment, uh, industrial internet of things, uh, which 
in, is enabled by those digital passports and digitalization of processes. So everything becomes connected. Everything can be driven by modern machine learning or AI algorithms. And this is the true transformation. This is the future. This is where we're going. Very good. Thank you, Mikhail. And AJ, can you talk us through um, first what uh, Worth does as, as a supply chain solutions provider and how additive manufacturing um, fits in with uh, supply chain solutions? Um, where, where do we go? How do we help uh, the uh, manufacturers uh, through this transformation? Maybe give us uh, some examples of, of how you've partnered uh, you know, with Baker Hughes too on, on, on this transformation. No, I mean, really, I'm just going to pick up a lot of the points that have already been discussed, um, because really what we specialize in is designing, you know, you already hit on is what we're uh, most known for is our vendor, vendor managed inventory and uh, our supply chain resiliency and planning and control, things like that. And so as we looked at it, uh, we started about three or four years ago using the technology and much like Baker Hughes is we used it for internal stuff first. We help prototype a part and bring it to a customer and then launch it in full production. We made text fixtures, we made tooling for our own kidding. And, but as we started to grow and we started to interact customers with it and provide them, it started to pick up steam because um, just like it's been said is it's not replacing everything. That's not the job. Just like when you walk into a machine shop, there isn't one lathe or one mill, there's a, a myriad of them because each one is extremely good at what it does. And you need that specialization when you're in a manufacturing environment to get exactly the uh, profile and properties you need. And so with additive is the beauty of that is you're able to, you know, a lot of it's been talked about decentralized is, for example, we've had customers that of course in 2020 have had a, a supply emergencies, right? So when before you might be looking at expedite fees, minimum orders, exp you know, freight, uh, you want to talk about the impact to your total um, uh, manufacturing environment is um, that's what additive replaces. It's not replacing the, the nuts and bolts and the washers, right? It's taking those unusual parts, those legacy parts, warranty parts, uh, things that need the, the geometry. Um, and the key is, is balancing it with uh, the total cost of ownership. So the reason why you don't 3D print washers is because there's a production method for that that is really tough to beat. That, that doesn't make sense for this mode of manufacturing. Um, but if it's a, an extremely specialized washer with contoured edges and some sort of unique feature, to print 10 of them, it is probably the best way to get it done. And that's kind of where we can help our customers. And that's what we specialize in is whether you want an on-site solution and, and own it from front to back and drive down your cost as much as possible. We have stuff for that. Or if you want to outsource it, we have programs for that as well. Um, but what we're specializes in is when we see that item is we can use our classic supply base and tell you with that quantity at that size and that material, you, we don't see any performance gain or a cost gain by three. Why, why are you looking at this? And if it's an emergency, we can help them. But that's kind of our role is to help guide our customers day to day and say, listen, that is throwing good money at a, a bad solution. When a, but the gift now is being able to point them in the right direction, whether that be subtractive or additive. So for us, is, I guess, in a long roundabout way is we see the future being an increase of digital products and digital inventory as the technology gets faster and more robust. But the parts that it solves today are extremely painful. And so even though we say that around 5% uh, of the parts in a production environment are probably a good fit for additive as a rule of thumb, uh, that's going to go up over time. But that 5% is an extremely painful 5% when you spend four or five days trying to find it and then you ship it from somewhere overnight. That is what costs you your money, not the piece price. It's all of the work and the classic uh, laborious um, processes necessary to get something made and shipped in an expedited manner. Um, instead, you can have Mikhail, you can have uh, folks like Brent, um, have that file, email it to the printer platform that can meet all the characteristics in the modeling, and you can have uh, your uh, manufacturing autonomy with your specialist being in one location, but having that in part be anywhere in the world, right? So um, a lot of flexibility and a lot of freedom 
Um, and I don't think the implications are there yet. I think a lot of people when it came to the internets and cell phones and things like that is maybe they didn't think of all the paper waste that would go away, right? Going from faxes to CDs and CDs to email, things like that. Um, same thing with horses in New York City, right? Is New York City had about five feet of horse manure they would wade through. And then uh, they would come up with all sorts of kooky solutions. And then the automobile came along and there's no longer a problem. And I think that kind of leads into the next topic is how this decentralized manufacturing cuts down on the impact to the environment and waste and stuff like that. Well, before we move into to the, um, the, the environmental uh, impact and how additive manufacturing has positively affected that. Um, I, I want to touch on uh, the point that you brought up, AJ, um, on some of the pain points, right? And, and within supply chain, uh, the major pain point is around inventory, uh, especially with this environment that we've seen where you have too much inventory, not enough inventory. Um, but additive manufacturing allows our customers and, and manufacturers to have this digital inventory. Uh, so Brent, can you talk us through um, what that means uh, from your perspective? Yeah, thanks Becky. Um, you know, when, when we think about digital inventory, really what we're looking at is um, we have something uh, represented in the computer, it's a design that we want to be able to build somewhere at a point of need. And so that digital inventory is really the recipe or the, the set of uh, characteristics of this component that needs to then be delivered as a physical good somewhere in the world <laughs> at a future time and location, right? So digital stuff is cheap. We can, we can have you know, 20 different versions of this part if we want it, it doesn't really cost us much. But the thing it, that becomes important is how do we design this digital artifact so that we know that when it's produced wherever we want it to be produced in the world is actually going to work. It's actually going to be a good spare part for, uh, you know, uh, an oil rig, or it's going to be the right PPE for needed for some surgery in, uh, in India or whatever. And that's where the idea of simulation comes in is as you're creating these digital artifacts, we need to be able to represent that once they're, physically realized it will actually work as we hope it is, as we hope it'll work. Now, if we're using traditional manufacturing, then we have a lot of design and manufacturing constraints that need to go into that artifact, and it really limits us on what we can produce. So if we're using additive manufacturing, that design space opens up much greater, and we can make a more optimum digital artifact. But the, the second aspect of this digital artifact is it needs to be aware of how are we going to actually produce it. If we're just going to mill it or cut it, uh, then we just say grab a block of this material and cut it, you know, and, and it'll work because we produce it to work. If we're going to use additive manufacturing, though, we're actually creating the material during the manufacturing process. And a, a machine from vendor A in China may actually produce a different um, result than a machine from vendor B with powder supplier C in South Africa. And that's where, again, simulation can help us and say, okay, we've got all of these variables. We have an intended design that we want to work in a specific way. This digital inventory not only includes that geometry, but in some cases, we have to predict how do different machines work when they produce that geometry so that the end result actually will get the job done. So all of these things are part of that digital inventory when we think about it from an ANSYS perspective. And Brent, I just want to add on is something that I've noticed is we were so used to a design engineer would have a, a vision and they would hand it to us as a supplier and we would go have our hundreds of manufacturing partners and try to find somebody to fit is, you know, so many times they would come back and their idea would be diluted. It would not be Chris. It was rough around the edges because there is inherent um, barriers with traditional manufacturing. And so when we are able to bring those printers on site and the engineer actually becomes the end manufacturer, that's a, that's like a thought shift is the creativity in your solution, the ability to come up with, um, you know, uh, outside the box ideas becomes feasible because you have an outside the box comparatively solution to going to your internal machine shop or someone like that. So just as somebody that is a support player is the power of engineers to make that part with very little deviation is a very strong uh, uh, you know, movement that we're having with our customers. 
Well, and, and as a former professor, I used to teach design for manufacturing assembly, right? And we would teach all our students, here's how you design it for this kind of manufacturing process or this kind of assembly process, right? And we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars around the world educating existing designers on using that. But additive kind of throws a lot of these rules out of the window. And, and um, again, this digital inventory in some cases has to include that kind of thinking that, that often people have built up over expertise of you know 20 30 years as an expert who's using casting well if we want to be able to produce this anywhere in the world we somehow have to democratize that 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 knowledge so that designers anywhere can design for that that in process that's available in timbuktu for instance and so so you know again this using artificial intelligence simulation machine learning to, and then creativity of the of the young designer who maybe doesn't have all of this knowledge inherently how do we how do we then really come up with design anywhere manufacture anywhere we've got to have a lot of expertise built into the digital tools to help make sure this doesn't fall apart so that's the altruistic engineering thing and then me and jc are a fan of there's no tariffs on emails i think that's what we boil it down to is it's a lot easier but yeah yeah, I want to go back to the point, to make his point on, on the inventory management or the digital inventory management as a business from the business perspective, right? So the, the value, so what, the concept is beautiful from the romantic perspective that you want to have an inventory, digital inventory, and the people imagining their, in, in, in their handsets like, oh, I'm going to replace my physical inventory for these tera, terabytes of data in this, uh, in this drive, and that will equivalent to my, my digital management. Now, that even that is a concept, you know, we're far from there, right? So we are, we're, we're evolving from a process that will actually have a lot of adaptation to get to that point. Now, there is value in that, in that, in that journey. Uh, the, the, the business model of the mentoring management needs to be changed. You know, it's not only to transfer a piece from the physical to a digital, you need to transfer the value from ourselves, for the value for all the parties involved in, the, in, in, in this ecosystem. Uh, and that's a partnership between uh, birth and, uh, for example, in, in, in this team that we have put together, how we create the value that is a win-win for everybody that actually drive a new business model to go into the, take advantage of that fourth industrial revolution, put it that way. Now we have, well, there are different values, different, different initiatives that will attract you into that model. You know, perfectly, the, the first one that everybody came, uh, is like, what is the urgency, right? Do you have a value for the customer from the urgency perspective? And that, that's, that's no discussion about it. Now, if you can actually, as, as AJ mentioned, if you can actually replace 5% to 12% of your inventory and have that in a digital format with a lead time reduction, then you have a cash flow impact directly to the customers. And that's one of the benefits that we have looked internally. And in some cases, we're looking also with our partners externally. That's one of those. Now, when you go into that digitalization, you understand that now you have the power of customization, right? So in the standard manufacturing, you have X, extra small, large, medium, right? And you, everybody has to fit in one of those. So in the new world, you may not have to do that. So you have a customized product for the application. Now, what comes with the customization is that you increase the performance, you increase the satisfaction in some cases, right? So now you have sat very, very satisfied with your product you're receiving and you have a competitive advantage against our competitors that has no that satisfaction. That is an, an intangible value, but at the same time, you're reducing your net book value of the cash flow because you really have a reduced inventory. You don't have cash trap in those inventory, but your customer is way, way more satisfied to have a customized product that fits for their performance. Now, with the new additive feature, so the, the, the extra advantage that you receive, is that now you can increase the performance of some other products from the engineering perspective, from matrix perspective, we can actually have probably two times life of that product. You, have, you can have a performance increase in the power output, for example. You have a you know, carbon footprint reduce it because now you're more efficient. So there are some inherent benefits that drive an additional value that depending on who's the customer, who's the end user, will actually you know, put a you know, price ratio value to it. And, that, and that's what is going to drive the business. Uh, in reality, is, is something that will create an end user, customer, value from the, from the customer perspective, but at the same time, what is the manufacturer, what are the OEM going to take of it? So we could be a little bit more efficient. We have all this data management that we're working and the advantage of having everything on the internet, we can iterate and actually have a product that fits for each one of the customers. You can have a real-time modification, your cost of prototype is so low now, 
because you have ANSYS, now you have, you have other tools like ANSYS that you can actually model that and make sure that actually works before we actually produce it. And we have all these distribution network that we can actually work and fit for purpose our channels, fit for purpose our capacity, fit for purpose our products, that uh, it's just a different way of thinking. The next question is how we monetize that in the digital world, how we convert that in a value proposition for all the parties. And that's, that's the part that we need to actually, you know, educate our customers and educate ourselves, our internalized structures as well, because we have been working like this for years, right? JC, yeah. it's good to bring up the business uh, side of it, because certainly manufacturers aren't investing in this type of technology just because, right? It has to drive value um, and certainly um, reducing time to, uh, you know, to for its support supply chain and bringing, having parts uh, there quickly helps save them time. Uh, so that's certainly, you know, the, the value that, you know, one of the values that they're looking for. Um, another one of the values that manufacturers are looking for from additive printing is this reduction of footprint, of carbon footprint. Um, you know, other countries across the globe are asking manufacturers, how can you um, spend less on energy and reduce your carbon footprint? Mikhail, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing with working with manufacturers, how they're able to achieve this reduction uh, by working and investing in additive manufacturing? Yes, sure, Becky. Um, the, the first uh, and obvious impact is if you move manufacturing to the point of use, you eliminate logistics. And logistics is, uh, is from Lean Six Sigma perspective is a waste. You're moving product from one point to another, you're not adding any value to that product. So if you can manufacture or fabricate it at the point of consumption, uh, that's a big benefit. Now with additive also, you can combine processes, you can um, eliminate assemblies. So your manufacturing process becomes a lot simpler and uh, you eliminate footprint um, of, of those manufacturing processes and even further you reduce energy, uh, you reduce emissions. So th there's a benefit uh, to everybody for that. Uh, I'd like also, I'd like to address, address a common misconception that with additive, what, what you need to do to localize manufacturing with additive is to buy a 3D printer and then you can just print whatever you want, spare parts on demand and start designing new things um, you need an ecosystem around it. You need other um, other components, you need expertise. And a very important topic that uh, people usually um, don't talk about is subject matter expertise. Uh, you do need a subject matter expertise within that industry or that, um, that portfolio product family where you implement your additive process whether it's from design perspective, how do you design, what are the potential failure modes, how do you validate the design, all of that requires that specific product knowledge. And then from manufacturing perspective, if you talk about uh, what is the first article qualification, what is the uh, QA, QC process that you establish to make sure that product um, that you put into the market or give to your customers that it, uh, it meets all the requirements. So that that needs specific subject matter expertise that is, it still needs to be there. Yes, we're democratizing the, the process of manufacturing, um, but that knowledge needs to be there, whether it's uh, this, this spare parts are in aerospace, automotive or energy industry. So this is very important. And uh, the, last, the last point I, I wanna uh, address here is uh, what uh, AJ was talking about inventory and different categories of inventory. Uh, technology evolves and those shift, but there are all, always, there are parts that you simply will not print. They, they either cannot be printed because technology is not there today, or they should not be printed because uh, economics is not there. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make any sense because there is a process established for them, except for the cases when it's a true emergency situation like in, um, in printing PPE uh, equipment uh, for uh, COVID response, there was no, supply chain was there, but the part is needed today. And I can't have it today unless I print it. That these are true exceptions where we utilize uh, additive for. 
and then there are specialized parts where you you do have long lead times you have complex designs you don't need mass production volumes for those but the demand for those parts sometimes drives this bull loop effect when um, the, the customer demand you, it's unpredictable and this drives so this amplifies the um the the impact uh, the demand on the downstream on the supply chain where you start producing more and that creates even more inventory that further um, creates longer um, lead times in, in the system. So this is also where additive helps. If you move that demand uh, and supply to a single point, uh, to the point of use. And then back to my subject matter, which is there are also parts and products that you, you have to have specialized expertise to manufacture, to design those manufacturing processes um, and materials and qualification methods. Uh, as example from Baker Hughes is our gas turbine uh, product line where we, we had to develop proprietary additive materials and additive processes and this expertise is extremely difficult to uh, to localize or, or move somewhere else. This requires a lot of knowledge and, and a lot of um, a lot of work. Yeah, thank you. No, and Mikhail, I think for me is there's just stories that we've had, which here's an example of that kind of decentralized manufacturing, but a centralized expertise maybe where um, a new OSHA regulation comes out, and you have 20 sites across 15 states. And you have to figure out a way how to update the machine guarding on a bunch of the same equipment that's in those states. Is So what the customer had is they had some 3D printers on site or at a couple sites. So those sites were able to um, find that replacement part, which was engineered at their headquarters. They tested it with uh, FAA software like ANSYS to verify that the part they make is going to work. And then they're able to... Uh, the uh, branches that already had a 3D printer, they were operational within 48 hours with a part that was created by the head engineer that was validated by the head engineer and then it was distributed, much like how a CEO might push out an email to everybody is, they were able to automate that. The 13 or so states that did not have a 3D printer locally, they, had to, they still went to 3D printing to turn around the product quickly, but then we were shipping it. And now the shipment's late, and now it's the weekend, and now it's this, and now it's that. And it's just variance where the customer turned around and goes, for X amount of dollars, I could have saved Y. Because they know how much that uh, line down costs them every day. And for another six figures in equipment, it was a sliver of what they would have actualized in uh, um, cash out of pocket. So again, is there's these real world things going on today where you can centralize your expertise, you have the software and the folks that, that uh, you know, can take it up to the highest levels of your, of your corporation, get it okay, but then push out that manufacturing to local entities because they don't require new expertise. They just require to have the equipment and keep it in running order. So just a lot of power in this and how it can connect people. Thanks, AJ. And I know we want to move and move to our, our final uh, slide around questions. We want to make sure we have time um, after this presentation that you can chat with us or reach out uh, directly to our, our panelists. Um, but Brent, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with you. Any final thoughts on uh, the future of supply chain um, and, and how uh, we can be prepared? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think there's been it's interesting. There's been over the last 10 years sort of this flurry of, oh, additive manufacturing is going to change everything. Everybody's going to you know, have an additive manufacturing machine or a 3D printer in their house. And, you know, when we're, you know, if our doorknob breaks, we're going to print a new doorknob and all this sort of stuff. And then people all over the world buying these machines because GE announces, hey, we're saving millions of dollars by using 3D printing. And so you have this hype cycle, right? And then people realize, well, I bought this little cheap 3D printer and I, I can't repair my car with it. You know, what's, what's up? You know, that's just what I was. So you had this overhype <laughs> and then you had kind of like this depressed, depressed state of a little bit of like, wow, it can't do everything all the time for us instantly. And now what I think we've been talking about today is really the realistic 
hype. <laughs> You know, additive manufacturing is going to change supply chains. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt. It already is um, transforming supply chains worldwide uh, across, uh, as we said here, maybe 5 to 12% of the types of components that are used today. And I think that number is going to go up and up. But I think what we want to say is it it takes things like that subject matter expert. It takes expert software. It takes designers who know what they're doing. But if you set up a system to take advantage of this and you have that system, you know, vetted with some experts, you've got good software, you've got good machines, you have, you know, great companies uh, aiding you like Worth and, and uh, Baker Hughes, then you can do it, right? It, it's possible. We do this today. Um, but I think what you're going to find is not only like the group of companies we have on the screen here doing it today well, you're going to find more and more and more companies doing it well around the world. And so I'm excited about this. I've been in additive manufacturing for almost 30 years. It's been my whole uh, my whole career has been additive manufacturing. And for me, this is this is the excitement because we are changing the world. The the world is transforming. And if this vision of the fourth industrial revolution, which additive manufacturing is helping to enable, this means that my kids, my grandkids can live meaningful lives and contribute to the worldwide economy and live wherever they want. Um, and so that's kind of cool. It's a neat thing that we're seeing this transformation occur. And so but just say thank you for involving me in the conversation today. Well, thank you. Brent. Thank you, Mikhail, JC, and AJ. I, I think it was a great discussion and we look uh, forward to continuing the conversation with you. Again, please reach out to our panelists uh, in the chat function as well as just directly with their contact information listed on Form Next. Thank you, everyone. No, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.